Ah, oh, good evening. Welcome to Axe and Frux, uh, Season 2, Episode 15. Uh, it's the 7th of February, um, 2016. And tonight I've got with me uh, Gina, and I think you're in Georgia. I can't remember the town, but Georgia way, isn't it, Gina? That's right. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. And we've also got my old mate, Ron. All right, Ron? Yes, Andy, I'm all right. Just got in in time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit windy here. Uh, I mean, that's outside, not inside. But anyway, um, yeah, well, we're going to have a little discussion about the cashless society they've been trying to bring in for how long. And also, I think um, they're really going to push it this, this year, amongst other things. And um, we're going to see, see what happens. I've, I've got a couple of articles that I'd like to just briefly go over. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll then we'll, we'll throw it open. And if you've got any articles, I can screen share, screen share and we can, we can go, and go into it that way. So let me just clip this here and put that there. And let's go on here. Right. Okay. Uh, not that one. There we are. This is. Um, I just checked this. Um, can you see the screen, uh, Ron? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I, I can see it. Sorry, I turned the mic off. That's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, this, looks, looks okay. this is an article by Small Glid or Small Gold. It's. Um, They've got a reason to do it because they're into into um, buying and selling gold and silver. But um, there's no there's no harm in that. Not in today's today's uh, climate, I don't think. Anyway, this is cash and freedom under attack. The cashless society, central planners dream freedom's a nightmare. Freedom's nightmare. The world is heading towards a cashless society. A cashless society has the danger of becoming a priceless one. A priceless society, one where private property ownership is compromised, individual choice, privacy, and freedom are eliminated. Uh, welcome to the cashless society, part one. There is no war on cash. It's only a war if two sides are fighting. Instead, there are a series of government and bank-led initiatives designed to remove cash from your pockets and wallets. Who's complaining? Who's doing anything about it? This is part of a two-part series, Welcome to the Cashless and Priceless Economy. Part one, Welcome to a Cashless Economy, will deal with the destruction of cash. And part two, Welcome to the Priceless Economy, will explore the various ways the price discovery is being destroyed and the role, and the role a cashless society plays in that destruction. Cashless society, coupled with other forces, will eventually lead to a priceless society where prices will not be arrived at by market forces through supply and demand, but rather set by central planners and all purchases tracked and taxes collected on them. Eventually, purchases of items deemed to be required by central planning authorities will be mandated by deduction from your account. Recently, there have been a growing number of examples of government coercion in the private, personal and economic affairs of its citizens. None, however, would be as far-reaching as a government ban, partial or complete, on the use of cash. Those who would give up liberty for convenience deserve neither liberty nor convenience. Cash is inconvenient. Central planners favour a cashless society, ostensibly for our own benefit. Cash, they argue, like truth, is inconvenient for use. Proponents of a cashless global society where money can be transferred in a mouse click anywhere in the world, point to the convenience of such a society, eliminating money in a specie form and digitising it eliminates the need to carry cash. After all, digital money is more convenient than lugging around bills or coins for large purchases and simply simplifies cross-border transactions. Bill Gates, oh my God, whose uh, Gates Foundation rallies a call for global citizens labels cash a trap and trashes cash in this short video. We won't go to that. Uh, Bjorn Ulvius, uh, that's the man with the beard, isn't it, or the other one, of the music group ABBA, believes in the cashless society so much he no longer uses cash 
and the Yabba Museum does not accept it. Well, I'm blay. For savings, uh, Janet Yellen, uh, chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, recently quipped, cash is not a very convenient store of value, as central banks do value the currencies they manage by printing more of them and keeping interest rates at close to or below zero. Holding cash indeed becomes an unprofitable and inconvenient, causing otherwise savers to spend it or throw it into the stock market. Mandatory convenience. While there are indeed benefits to digital money, convenience, however, should be a choice, not an edict. Ban open carry cash. What if you are not allowed to carry a large amount of cash or to spend it as you please? In the Central Planners Cashless Society vision, carrying large amounts of cash may brand you as a potential criminal or terrorist or the act of, a, of openly carrying cash. <laughs> may itself make you a criminal. So, sound far-fetched? France and Greece are just two countries that outlaw large cash transactions over $1,000. In the United States, Louisiana already bans the use of cash in yard sales. Central planners also cite self-serving reasons for going cashless, including cash interferes with monetary policy, in doing God's work in managing the money supply, interest rates and the economy, central bankers and their apologies cite that monetary policy can be rendered ineffective and even irre irre irrelevant if people don't conduct their financial affairs as the central planners wish they would. Interest rate manipulation as a monetary tool. We've seen central banks react to econ economic crisis and sluggish economies by instituting low interest rates then zero interest rates and finally negative interest rates with diminishing effectiveness. Interventionist monetary policies are designed to end the boom-bust cycles inherent in capitalism. Ironically, or perhaps tragically, the largest booms and busts, etc., the financial crisis of the 2008 have occurred under interventionist monetary regimes. Some have argued that banning cash would help central banks finally end the boom-bust cycle for forcing everyone to spend only by electronic means from an account held at a government-run bank give the authorities far better tools to deal with recessions and economic booms. Alarming proposal to strip individuals of the power to conduct of their financial affairs, transfer that power to central authorities are all too common. Negative interest rates won't work if cash is around. Kenneth Rogoff and of Harvard argues that the existence of cash interferes with implementing successful negative interest rate policies. Artificially low interest rates and zero interest rates encourage spending and risk taking over savings as little or no interest is paid. Intuitively negative interest would operate in the same way. Why save cash in a bank when it not only doesn't pay interest but costs to keep it there? Rogoff notes astutely. However, that hoarding cash may be inconvenient and risky, but if rates become too negative, it becomes worth it. Those wanting to save their money and not have to pay to keep it in the bank that has instituted negative interest rates might instead withdraw their cash and keep it elsewhere, but not in a bank safe deposit box, thus preserving their capital and thwarting the central planner's negative interest rate policy goal of discouraging savings and encouraging spending. Central bankers might do prudent savers who remove their cash from banks to avoid negative interest rates as felonious criminals who hold cash with an intent to hoard and damage the world economy. Mr. Rogoff doesn't endorse the criminalization of holding cash but rather concludes there are increasingly strong arguments for exploring the phase now of cash to help central banks implement their negative interest rate policies. Going cashless saves. Another argument against cash is that it is expensive to mint and print. Oh yeah. The US government is looking into ways to reduce the cost of minting those pesky coins, including using zinc instead of copper and nickel. Denmark is touting cash-free shops as a way of cutting retail costs. In both instances, an overall cost of cash production and use of de min bit minimis 
in the grand scheme of things. The counter-argument that bankers promote in a cashless society fail to admit is that they take a fee on every cashless transaction. Cash prevents terrorism and tax evasion. The other primary argument that cashless proponents make is that cash is at the centre of illegal activities, including the drug trade and terrorism. Also, cash transactions often go unreported and taxes on them unpaid. Eliminating cash will eliminate these problems, or will it? If you have enjoyed this report, please consider buying your precious metals, blah, 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 through them. Yeah, okay, that's, that leads me into the, the next little bit on it, uh, which is which is this one here, uh, which it goes on to say, um, the dark side of a cashless society. I think going cashless is just about convenience. Here are some downsides of going cashless to make you think again. Welcome to the cashless society, part two. In part one, welcome to the cashless society, there is no warm or cash. We noted that the proponents of a cashless society tout convenience as a selling feature. Uh, paraphrasing Ben Franklin, we noted, those who would give up liberty for convenience deserve neither liberty nor convenience. Enhanced convenience is a dual-edged sword. A cashless society may be more convenient, but also means a loss of freedom. Cash and economic freedom are inseparable. That cash is an instrument of laissez-faire and that each implies and requires the other. Here are some significant risks and downsides to going cashless. Enhanced convenience also means loss of control. Cashless means automatic. If money is easy to spend, it is also easy to take. Convenience can easily become ty tyranny. Automatic payments that come directly from your bank account illustrate the point. Take a look at this letter that health insurance company Anthem sent to its policyholders. It might take a little bit of reading because it's very small. My eyes ain't good at it. Dear sir, whatever, uh, Thank you for choosing us for your health coverage. We value your business and we have good news to share with you about your health plan. As a result of new guidance from the federal government about the Affordable Care Act, you can keep your current health plan and network of doctors for another year. Mm. Aren't you lucky? This gives you more time to understand how health care reform will work for you and your family. And it is the best option if you want to keep your existing benefits and continue to visit the same doctors, hospitals and pharmacies. Enclosed is a notice from the Department of Health and Human Services that we are required to give you. While it suggests you need to contact us to keep your current health plan, this is not necessary because of the way your policy renews as long as you pay your premium, your coverage will continue. Will my rate change? If you choose to stay on your current plan, your monthly rate will change from $891.31 to $987.66. Your rate may have been impacted if you move to an area with higher or lower medical costs or change the number of people covered by your policy. In addition, your rate may reflect a change in your age. What should I do now? Nothing. If you want to keep your current coverage, we'll adjust your rates and automatically just continue to pay your new premium. It's that simple. Do we have a choice? Or do I have choices? Yes, we want you to have the health plan that makes the sense for your needs. If you decide not to stay in your current plan, you have options. Two options. Choose a new Anthem plan at your renewal. Choose a plan if there's uh, ACA requirements and there's many for you to choose from. You can compare plans and check it with your doctors via the network. Change my coverage, go on to Anthem, look up your pharmacy, benefit, see if your drug's covered. You need to choose to make your initial payments, a new 15 days, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, you may shop in the health insurance marketplace, also called the exchange. See the enclosed notice for more details. We're here to help you. If you request your question options, your insurance broker, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for trusting Anthem, blah, blah, blah. Now just go in and take it and put it up. You won't even need to know it's gone up. So they just have automatic access and take it out. And 
basically we won't even have any control over anything not that we've got a lot of control over it now but it can get worse and from letter if you like your plan you can keep your plan just pay more we make it easy with automatic deductions there you go putting aside the loss of economic freedom that one must buy health insurance under the Affordable Health Care Act the Anthem Good Newsletter above highlights how easily your digital money can be taken from you. It's easy to pay more. Anthem will just take money out of your bank account every month. It's that simple. As I said. Risk of confiscation. The convenience of digital money that allows you to spend your money more easily also makes it easier for the banks, governments and thieves to take it. Bank bail-ins. In 2013, bank depositors in Cyprus experienced the bailing. The failing banks in Cyprus were partially bailed out by the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund on the condition that some depositors would also have to forfeit some of the money owed to them. This was done unilaterally and depositors simply uh, lost a portion of their money in the bank. There was no meeting of creditors with depositors with the bank, just a swift removal of a portion of the depositors money. Bailing legislation is now in existence in many countries and Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Stanley Fisher, noted last year that the United States is also preparing proposals to allow for bailinable debt. <laughs> the move on bailinable debt. The message to the depositors is clear. When you put your money in a bank, you are a creditor of the bank and if it goes bust, you are at the bottom of the list of creditors. Your money will be seized as part of any approved plan, perhaps even before the broke bank files for bankruptcy. Think your money is safe in the bank? Think again. Civil forfeiture seized first? Ask questions later. Your bank account can be raided by government authorities like the Internal Revenue Service without a notice or reason given. If the IRS believes your account deposit or withdrawal activity is suspicious, and or may involve a patent decide to avoid reporting requirements, they may seize your account. According to the Institute of Justice, the IRS seized more than 242 million from over 2,500 accounts for illegally structuring deposits or withdrawals. One third of these cases resulted in no criminal charges filed and involved deposits and withdrawals under $10,000. Here is just one example of a convenience store owner who had 100,000 seized from his bank account. Done nothing wrong, nothing to worry about, think again. Risk of theft. Proponents of the cashless society actually tout the theft is more difficult. Bjorn Orvius of ABBA, oh, dancing queen, claims that he became interested in eliminating, ca eliminating cash after his son's house was burgled. Eliminate cash, Mr. Orvius reasons. And you eliminate theft. Bill Gates echoes Mr. Ulvis, Ulvis, I can't pronounce his name, Bjorn, statement saying, cash is a bit of a trap. It can be stolen. Perhaps it's excusable for a pop star not to recognise that theft of digital money is far easier than a burglary involving cash. But for Bill Gates, the former CEO of the world's largest software company, to make that claim, that a downside of cash is that it can be stolen is irresponsible, especially since his Microsoft Windows product is notorious for security breaches. The number of stories, bank account and Bitcoin digital wallets being hacked and drained are legion. Think digital money is safer than cash and can't be stolen? Think again. Crime is easier. Some actually believe that in a cashless society that crime will go down and drug dealers will go out of business. Mr. Ulvaeus Bjorn, further reason without cash, we would avoid the bicycle thief and the television thief and who would buy the copper that is stolen if they could not sell it for cash. Mm. Cycles, televisions, computers and cell phones will continue to be stolen in a cashless society because they have value in and of themselves and will be stolen for use or stolen to sell in exchange for other forms of money e.g. cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, private or foreign currencies, or traded for other items of value. Drug dealers won't go out of business. They will just take payment for their wares in other national or cryptocurrencies, personal services or other items of value, stolen or otherwise. In a cashless society, theft will occur online and in far larger amounts than cash than 
than cashouists. An online thief never has to confront his victim, commit violence, crack a safe, get past an alarm system, dog alarm, guards and carry away his loot. Rather, in a cashless society, the cyber thief merely has to hack the system where the money is. The online heist involves no risk of death or threat to the thief's personal safety and can be done from anywhere in the world. Think crime will go down if we go cashless? Think again, risk of system failure. Without cash, the value of currency would have no independent value outside a functioning bank system to which you have access. Your money wouldn't work without a functioning bank system. Banking system. If the banking system is down due to a power outage, solar fair, financial crisis, internet failure, hack network crash, your money is unavailable and potentially lost. If backup files are lost, how do you prove you had $15,000 in your account? Think digital banking system is stable and secure? Think again. Risk of being exiled from the system. Even if the digital banking system was 100% foolproof, you may end up being shut out of the system for wrongdoing, actually alleged, bad credit or failure to pay banking fees, or maybe the victim of identity theft as a precaution your account may be closed. Without access to the banking system, how will you pay your bills and buy items you need? Think a cashless system is more convenient? Think again. Risk of not having access to the system may lack, you may lack the means to have access to a computer, Smartphone or internet connection, or your computer or smartphone may get damaged or stolen. Would never happen in a cashless society, right? And you have no backup. Without a way to access the banking system, what would you use to buy food? Think it can't happen to you? Think again. Risk of creating a vast, powerful, powerful criminal underground economy. Cashless contraband, banning items or substances often increase their alert. Passing laws prohibiting widespread behaviour often creates a criminal underclass of people willing to break those laws. Millions routinely have violated the 18th Amendment to the US Constitution by selling, buying and consuming alcohol beverages in the 1920s. Today, millions break drug and gun laws to procure narcotics and firearms. Other than the most ardent Bitcoin proponents, or those with a real need to use a currency outside the banking system, where do the very few today would risk jail time or fines to use Bitcoin if it was made illegal? Bash, ban cash, however, and the number of people willing to break the law and use a banned currency would explode exponentially. Ban cash, and usually law-abiding citizens may break the law, and continue to use the cash that the authorities were unable to confiscate. Sniffing, cash sniffing dogs are <laughs> cash sniffing dogs, an unintended consequence of government's desire to collect more taxes and to track transactions is that it will drive people out of the system. People whose bank accounts have been seized or have been otherwise denied access to the banking system will revert to other means of exchange. Currently, few people risk jail time or fines to use cash, but for those exiled from the banking system, or those fed up with excessive banking fees, it may be their only alternative. Given the vast amount of dollars in currency, form bills and coins in circulation today in the US and overseas, these dollars and other currencies could be used as forms of payment for those outside the cashless banking system. To combat, combat the lawless use of cash, the government would have to engage in an actual war on cash and treat cash as contraband with an increase in training dogs to sniff out cash to be confiscated or further investments in machines to find hidden cash. In a mandated cashless society, a robust, robust black market in alternate, alternative currencies and goods services will certainly evolve. As a result, the government may ultimately collect fewer taxes and spend more money combating illegal currencies and transactions. Think the government will collect more taxes in a cashless society? Think again. Raise the cost of doing business. If there is no cash, even though the cost of producing currency is near nil, a monopoly can change whatever it wants to use digital cash in a form of holdings, holding your money and transaction fees. In a cashless society, banks most likely banks most likely, not the USA Treasury, will be the primary creators of digital currency. For this service, they will continue to charge credit card deposits and late fees. 
For consumers and merchants, this means that they will pay currency issuing banks a portion on every transaction. Think going cash it will reduce transaction costs. Think again. Results in loss of freedom. Bake that cake, pay that rise, buy that insurance. With a, we have had witnesses out based politics who wrote personal freedom in recent years. From forced labour, bakery required to bake a cake, to forced pay raises to labour, minimum wage laws, to forced purchases, health insurance, government has issued effects requiring the foregoing. While going cashless may be convenient, when you choose to buy something, but if a purchase is thrust officiously upon you by a government order, your money, money can be removed from your account to pay for it. Convenient, of course, this type of forced convenience results in a removal of freedom of choice and how you may, what may wish to spend your money. In the House of Deed, Fyodor Dostoevsky noted, money is coined liberty and so it is ten times dearer to a man who is deprived of freedom. If money is jingling in his pocket, he is half consoled, even though he cannot spend it. Money can always and everywhere be spent. Take cash away, remove that liberty. Uh, we're almost there, I think. Uh, well, it, it actually goes on a lot, lots and lots and lots more bits and pieces about, um, you know, uh, what it all means. And I don't think people have really thought too much about it. They've been... Um, uh, cajoled into um, buying things online with PayPal and bank, um, Western, whatever it is, and cards and all types of things. Um, so, you know, I think people have, have forgotten about this. Even though I don't know what it's like in America, Gina, but here we're, we're down to about 3 or 2% is actually cash, the other 97, 98% is all done on the computer, it's not even printed anymore, you know, so uh, it's just, there we go, um, like I say, I think I've covered pretty much, well, these articles pretty much cover um, most of what we're, uh, what cash society means, there's probably a lot more too, um, it's, um, what do you think? I mean, have, have we taken our eye off the ball with the cat? I know it's been trying to be brought in for a long time, but um, I noticed that uh, with Japan going negative interest the other week, along with Sweden, Denmark, um, what's the other one in Europe? Um, there's quite a few now that have got negative interests, and basically, if you've got a fair bit amount in there, 10,000, 15,000. You actually have to pay them to hold it in their mungy little crap houses called banks. And um, of course, it's not your money, it's theirs. So they can just shut up, shop anytime, and that's your, that's your lot. And um, yeah, anyway, I'll put it over to uh, whoever wants to um, um, pass any comments on the cash of society. Perhaps uh, you've got some more more things to say about it that then articles didn't cover. Well, it's like, again, science fiction coming true, isn't it? I mean, um, over the years, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've watched, I can now say is now happening, you know, but it won't be called cash anymore. It'll just be credits. How many credits you have, you earn credits because it won't be cash. Cash to me is something that is physical, you know, that you hold in your hand, you know, and uh, you know you kind of could, you know years ago guess and kind of like know that this was the direction that things were heading in. I mean, it was but maybe a year ago when I picked up on this um, thing that they intend to roll out. I believe it is this year in Denmark, you know, that they were saying that um, most purchases now are done online. Um, very little cash now was being used and, um, you know, they would be rolling this system out, you know, but then, you know, I, I mean, like, I, I'd really like to know how they're going to make this work because, I mean, basically, you know, you're not going to find a point 
somewhere in the middle of a forest where you could theoretically zip your card in to pay for something. It's just not going to happen. You've still got to go to certain places. The thing is with cash, when it's in your pocket, it's there and it's ready accessible. You know, why they should want to take this away from us, I don't know. I mean, again, it's going to have a complete knock-on effect. Um, you know, like in, in this country, Andy, you know, we you know, um, we call them you know, uh, boot sales, car boot sales, or what be like a trunk sale in, in, in uh, America. And um, obviously, like your yard sales that you have out there. You know, you sell a few bits, you get a little bit of cash. Well, you, are you going to have a machine? At your yard sale, where the people who are buying for the products are going to zip their card in to make payment for that. I mean, to me, this whole thing is about totally controlling everything that you have. You are now being nannied. You are not fit to look after your own money. They can't trust you with looking after your own money. So they're going to look after it for you. You know, and um, you, you, you can more or less see this coming from a mile away, you know, as I say, you know, and um, is there any way out of it? Or are we going to have a split society all through the world where you have those who are, are in the system and those who cannot, for some reason, take part in that system, you know, because they've, um, you know, either been thrown off it because they don't, don't want to comply with the system you know uh, 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 are we going to be like um, in some kind of prison because that's what it's starting to feel like that we're, we've now been imprisoned <laughs> you know because we can't be trusted with their own money you well, know and, um, it's the creep 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 one of the totalitarianist totalitarianism dictator yeah despotic um, <laughs> fascist I mean there is you could call them a lot you could roll all the isms yeah, let, let, me, let me share it, an article with you guys yeah check this one out see that alright hang on I'm not uh, I'm gonna, uh, well, I can just see uh, a picture within a picture within a picture within a picture it looks like a Pink Floyd cover How's that? How's that? Any good? Yeah. No, nothing yet, PJ. No. No. And in the meantime, I uh, did find it's a 80% uh, credit, 20% uh, cash here in America still. Yeah. Wow, that's quite high, Gina. Yeah, I think I thought so too. I was surprised. Uh, although I see Louisiana can have no yard sales with uh, cash. It's, it's I don't know how they're going to do that. How's that? Any better now? I've got a black screen, I have. Yeah, we're getting somewhere. Yeah, black screen. <laughs> it's a step closer. <laughs> Try again last time, yeah. How about now? No, we're having no joy. I'm not anyway. It says you're presenting to everyone, but uh, not even a black screen now, PJ. Oh, there we go. Ah, that? Yeah. yeah. The biggest threat to your wealth is the financial system. Oh, I never knew. <laughs> Let me just quickly scan through. I'll read it. You're out. Uh, the biggest threat to your wealth in 2016 isn't a stock market collapse or a failure of the social security system. It's not our national debt or a currency crisis. It's our financial system. The possibility of a financial terrorist attack that could wipe out your financial data and assets. Remember, if you have any money in the bank, you don't really have any money. You have bits and bytes. Even withdrawing too much can be problematic because banks don't usually hold that much cash on hand. Have you tried withdrawing more than 5,000 or 10,000? In case you're not aware, cyber terrorists have already broken into the world's most Secure digital systems. There's a few lists to look. I'm going to read them out as you can see. Um, the government obviously will not be able to stop it, so you must prepare for it. So, how is it done? The answer is simple keep a sizable amount of cash. 
four to six months worth of living expenses stored in a place you can easily access if such attack takes place. And either your credit card or your debit card will work. You'll need to put food on your table and the only way to pay for it will be with cash. And as um, Stav quite rightly said, Denmark last year hopes to boost its economy by eliminating cash. Um, and there's a little graph chart there. Don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Countries with a high rate of cash usage bear a higher social cost of cash, exceeding one percent of GDP. <laughs> One of the things I've noted with the first top countries in that graph, these countries have sparse populations. Well, they've either put us in European Union or we just don't come under that. Yeah, but so countries like Finland, Norway and Sweden, I mean, there's only 5 million people in Finland. Yeah. yeah. A bit less than that in Norway. What is it, about 8 million in Sweden? You know, they're quite large countries. People are sparsely, you know, spread over the country. I mean, you've got your main population hotspots. But, I mean, I, I noticed whilst living in Finland that a lot of transactions are done via the machine. You know, it, like the payment of bills and such like, you know, it's it's all uh, d done on cards out there. So I, I know most of these Scandinavian countries, you know, they're well into their technology. They love it. You know, uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, loving technology is, uh, you know, not always the way to go. Um, yeah, let's just check some of these other countries. Yeah, well, I was going to say also, too, with in America, it, it does seem kind of high, but when I think about the immigration, um, a lot of farm workers are uh, illegal aliens. They have to be paid in cash. There are plenty of people that work that are paid in cash for reasons other than they don't have a social security card. You've got a lot of, um, you know, business that um, moves with cash. And uh, I think um, in the reading it was very clear about that jingle in your pocket, how it does, you know, give you the at least the ability to think that you can purchase what you desire for the work that you've done. And um, uh, it, it's going to be hard to... Uh, transition over here I think also because when it ha for me the way I believe when it happens I think people are going to be in shock and I think that this was a good reading PJ brought up about you know be prepared for four to six months because honestly and unless you have a garden and you're already relying on other community outsourcing um, for um, appliances or products I was talking to PJ earlier about a group that a friend of mine showed me. It's a website. Uh, if I could show it to you, I don't know how to screen share. Um, but if I put it on my page, can you see what I've got now that I've clicked on? Uh, Stav might be able to tell you how to share your screen. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, if you go up on the left, there's a little green arrow on the left side of the screen, Dean. It says, if you have one, it says screen share, yeah? Yeah. Click on that, and then another box will come up, and then click on full screen, okay, and it should, should uh, share the screen. That was, that, was, that, was my final, that was my final article, which I'll just give you the headline there. Uh, look that one up if you wanted to read more about that. Let me pass it over to Jean and uh... Okay. Um, I found this because a friend of mine was saying that uh, they have Recycle.org all over the world, and it is all over the world. I did a little group uh, search uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, went over to Northern Ireland, and there's a post dated today for a cot someone wants to give away for someone that has the bolts to put it together. But the idea behind Free Cycle is that if you have an appliance that you're not using, say, I have a four bread toaster and I don't have a family anymore, I don't need that large little toaster, I can give it away here. This is free. You can't post anything for sale here.
but there'll be anything from TVs to lawnmowers to small appliances to clothing. And it was reminiscent to me of um, cyclic uh, fall festivals and spring festivals when the women would trade dresses or they would trade baby toys or trade um, uh, items of value so that the community, the greater community, this, and I'm talking about in the 1800s out in the West, um, uh, prairie days and things like that, that some of that uh, folk um, tradition is coming back uh, in some small festivals that I see. And I think that it could be built on building community so that there is a community that is recycling, is sharing commodities, so that when this comes, it won't be such a shock upon people. Um, because it is coming. I mean, I am in agreement with you guys for sure. Um, uh, I, I, I'd like to say my great grandfather, he, he took me under the porch in you know, 1968 and dug up a hole and uh, he pulled out a coffee can and he had a mason jar with a lid on it and he undid the lid and he pulled out money with a rubber band around it and he whispered to me, this is how you hide your money. Never put it in a bank. And when I grew up and told his dad about it, um, he told me, well, he lived through the Great Depression. That's why Papa never puts his money in the bank. But, you know, there's some truth to that. Um, there is going to certainly be no way to get it back. And I will assure you, as I'm th thinking you guys probably are aware, first thing's going to come out is your rent. Second thing's going to be your utilities. And I think the, probably the last thing you'll get is a little food budget. I mean, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's coming. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, yeah, that, we do have a uh, food circle over there, Gina, uh, all over the country, local ones, and, uh, and they're often put up on social media, uh, like FaceAke and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I know exactly what you're on about. Like, and I think um, there's a transition, isn't there, where if people are not prepared and they can't barter, they haven't got gardens, or they haven't got veg, they haven't got, can't feed themselves, if they're not prepared, then it's better to have at least a little bit of cash. And what I would say is take a leaf out of some of the countries like Somalia and Zimbabwe where their currency collapsed. So even their own money, I mean, I think it got to... Um, a one trillion, one trillion Zimbabwe dollar note they printed up, and you couldn't get a loaf of bread with it. So that that's that's the hyperinflation. Same in Somalia. So basically, what they're saying, as far as I know. Yeah, I remember that. That's they were just tomato ketchup on shelves, weren't they? That's right. Yeah. That, what they tended to go back to is they traded in any kind of silver coinage, whether it was old. It, whether it, it didn't matter about being in circulation because the, the currency had gone. Their monetary, their currency was worth nothing. So what they done was they done it on intrinsic value totally, and they done the same in Somalia, and um, they they trade in silver coins. It doesn't matter whose heads on it. <laughs> it doesn't matter when it was made. Um, I guess the eagle dollars and whatever silver eagle dollars and that sort of thing in America. I know a lot of people have. I've put them by, and I mean, you, the last place you would have put them is put them in a safe deposit box it's in a bank. So you, that, you don't really want to do that. Um, so I would say, even even if you can put something by intrinsically, even if it's money and it's small silver coinage, if it gets that bad, then you know, even your cash, if the currency is is gone, that's going to be you know um, light a fire with it anyway. So a bundle of that isn't really going to do it uh, if it gets to the extreme levels of the current complete currency total collapse. Um, so I mean, people done it in the 29:30 uh, crash with the with the gold and stuff like that. Uh, and I know they uh, was it Roosevelt at the time put orders in to seize the gold assets and whatever of people. But I mean, that if you'd have to be pretty stupid, say, Yeah, I've got a load in here, I'm sorry, do you want it? You know, again, use, use your noddle or use your head. So I would definitely, um, especially if you're unprepared and you're not 
you're not in a place where you ain't got a garden or you're, you're in a high-rise apartment and there's no chance, you've got no window boxes, you've got no access to grow even a tomato, then at least try and put some cash by even some as intrinsic value in silver or gold. Mostly small denominations of silver because if you've got one big silver dollar and you don't want to spend it all on a loaf of bread, you're going to have to hack a piece of that off in silver and it's a bit messing around. So I don't know, silver, the, the smaller denominations in America, Gina, I don't, don't know what they are, but over here, uh, I would say look into the Victorian silver currency if you can get hold of some of that old stuff from silver footnies, sixpences, um, foot, yeah, footnie joeys they called them, shillings, um, crowns, half crowns, uh, um, florins, all that sort of thing. But you could probably go as small as 3D, which is footnie joeys, which is silver. So again, if you've got that sort of thing, I would definitely uh, put it by. Don't 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 get rid of it and uh, get a little bit more of it because I think um, the the way that people are countries are now going into this negative interest with Switzerland, uh, sorry, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark are, and Japan, and um, I know. In France and most of the European countries, if you want any more, anything out equivalent to about a couple of grand, 2,000 quid or $4,000 or something like that, you can't get it anyway. They haven't got that cash. They don't keep cash in banks that amount. So you ain't going to get it out anyway. Um, so this is, what's, this is what's going to be... Um, it's been talked about a lot. But it's gone quiet for a while, and um, it's raising its ugly head again with quite a few articles. And with Japan alerting me the other day with the negative interest, I mean, crikey, that I don't know how that country keeps going. I really don't. They're obviously buying up all the American debt, <laughs> along with the Chinese. You're on mute, Gina. Silver from our coinage in uh, the 60s, uh, the quarters and the dimes and um, the nickel, there's no nickel anymore in, the, in our nickels and no copper in the pennies, there's zinc. So our coinage actually has no intrinsic value and um, I don't know about, the question I want to ask you guys is do you all have, you know, the gold and silver buyers? I mean, they come into town, it's like almost a church tent revival. They want to buy up any gold, loose gold, broken jewelry, you know, anything that they can uh, melt down, they give you, oh, high dollar prices. But they come into very impoverished areas and buy up all the gold and silver that these folks have or people might steal and sell and uh, no questions asked and then they leave town and I have noticed this trend for about 10 or 15 years and I thought you know what they are really doing uh, as they're transitioning away from any intrinsic value of our silver because my grandfather used to say uh, the coins were more valuable than the paper money he used to say oh we can't fool you with that paper money because the paper money had no value the real value was in the coins and until the 60s and 70s when they started taking it out, um, but they're buying it up. And I told my daughter just last week, I will see a day, or she will, that a, a gold necklace. She may take a, a link off of the gold necklace and buy, you know, half a loaf of bread with that, or a loaf of bread with that. I mean, so I don't want my children selling any of their jewelry, any of their gold, because as you were saying about the dime, how are you going to get, you know, a loaf of bread? Well, use that jewelry because. There's always going to be a black market or uh, some kind of a trading uh, outside of a system. And I think that the sooner that we practice good um, community roles of growing our own food and, and then again using something like recycle, posting free things when we have it that we can pass on to our neighbor, getting to know our neighbors. So when the shit hits the fan, you know, they're not coming over here to, to hurt you for a loaf of bread. Um, but I do. I wonder, are they buying up any, um, uh, you know, gold and silver, the antiques and things like that over there in impoverished areas? 
Uh, well, th this is something that's been going on for quite some time in this country. You know, just pop your gold in a bag and send it off to such and such a place, or your silver. You know, many of the, um, you know, like pawn shops, for instance, um, you know, you just take your gold or your silver down there, they'll give you a bit of cash for it. You know, there's um, there's, there's been a real surge, you know, in the market in that respect for, you know, the buying of precious metals. It's always been there, you know. Uh, I, I think when we had the last recession, we, we saw, um, like, more and more of these, um, you know, shops jumping up. You know, they, they'll even take your electrical goods, you know, for a, a small amount of money. Then if you don't go back in so much, you know, so long, they'll, you know, stick a price on it, put it in their window and try to make a profit from it that way. But they do, yeah, they'll take your gold and silver, you know, any, any, anything that's uh, of any, you know, uh, interest in value, you know, it's, it's, it's regular now, you know. It even is advertised on the TV. You know, we'll, we'll take your gold and silver, just contact us and, um, you know, we'll send you the information pack, send it back to us. You know, it's, it's so common, you know. But that, that's something I spoke about recently, um, with someone I know, you know, I was saying like, you know, this year could be really bad. You know, there's a lot of changes coming about, you know, and um, he seems to think that by buying and restoring um, certain cars that he seems to think has a value. I, I said, well, you, you know, if th things do get really tight, really bad, I said, you're better off investing your money in gold and silver. Yeah. I, I, you know, because I was saying to him, like, it's all very well and good having a vehicle that you think has a certain value. <laughs> um, but when push comes to shove, people will not want a classic car. They'll uh, want red. <laughs> they will want And they'll want to use their money or their valuables for buying that bread. I said, I, th I think you're wrong. You know, I said, just... You know, if you can get rid of those vehicles in the very near future, I said, just put your money straight back into something that is investable in that you know will have a long term value. You see, mm -hmm. gold doesn't rust, nor does silver. It, it doesn't shrivel up. It doesn't go away. It's always there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's a solid material. Cars eventually bite the dust. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no long-term value in them. You know, at the end of the day, you know, sooner or later, later they will be in the junkyard, but your gold won't. You know, yeah. and he kind of like looked at me and went, "Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah." You know. But no, the free, the free cycle thing. Yeah, we have that over here as well. You know, and that that is uh, quite a quite a good thing. In fact, strangely, I've noticed. Um, Recently, I don't know what it's like for the other guys, but um, you often, when you're walking down the street, somebody's put something out at the front of their house and they'll just say, free to whoever wants it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. now I've got a, a front door for my house that I've been playing around with today. It was about four or five doors up the road and um, I noticed it there the other day. And I thought, oh, that looks okay. But I, I went round to my car. And then when I came back, I thought, oh, yeah, that door's up there. I'll, I'll go and check it out, you know. So I went up there, took my tape measure up there, and it's like, it's exactly the same size as the door that I've got. But it's really nice. And it was free. You know, all there of you go. fixtures and yeah. fittings and that, you know. But um, it was just there. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what my hope is. A bit of a trend my now. Yeah, my hope is that the controllers, uh, who I call corporate master, will be stunned to see that um, common or poor people um, will be able to make it and maintain their uh, love and dignity for one another through barter, bartering or by giving. And we go from a taking world to a giving world, because this is yeah. definitely a taking world. And it even sounds like when he was reading the articles, oh, um, that it's a taking, what are they going to take off of our credit balance first? If they um, access our funds electronically, of course, they'll take rent, they'll take this, they'll take the priorities they feel must be paid. Oh, they'll take, they'll take yeah. your money. Yeah. So you know then I mean? it's, I, you know. 
I'm so suspicious of um, some of these so-called, um, uh, you know, um, internet hacks or people getting hold of your, um, you know, particulars. I mean, it's happened to my daughter, it's happened to my wife. We don't know how. Um, we think that we know how one of them came about um, was through, you know, wanting to buy something online and the, the website suddenly crashed just as my wife was putting the details in. And then, uh, you know, a little while later, the bank contacted my wife and said that um, there were some suspicious goings on uh, with her card details and someone was buying to a, or, or buying phone credit, um, you know, somewhere in the north of the country. Um, well, somebody had actually, you know, used it and had a small amount of money out of her account and then it happened to my daughter. In fact, it's happened to two of my daughters. One of my, my daughters actually went to her bank account and discovered that um, someone had um, purchased two lots of air tickets to South America using her bank details. Well, I don't trust banks as it is, never have done. Um, you know, you only have to look at what's happened. Um, was it in Cyprus where the EU took money out of people's accounts? If they had so much money in the account, the EU, to uh, get out of trouble, pulled a load of money out of uh, accounts in Cyprus. Um, but this can also be done in an underhand way. This is, you know, what I strongly believe will happen. You know, uh, because there's millions of people on, in the world. You know, um, with bank accounts, right? Even if it's one pound taken out of your account per month, just from you personally, but they do that to everybody, they're going to be profiteering and you will not even notice it. And I say that because. Um, how often do you actually check your bank account? I mean, like, I get a bank statement, I have a quick glance through it. I was actually uh, charged for um, some uh, insurance on a you know, on a PC I bought. I'd only actually asked the company to insure it for one year. But 18 months later, or nearly, no, actually, it was, it was getting closer to uh, two years, I thought, what is this payment that's going out of my bank account? You know, they were still taking money from my account without me noticing. And then I had to argue with them. And they said, well, it's your fault. You're in charge of your account. It's down to you to, to notice. You know, and they said, well, you can't have your money back. I said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, you've acted totally illegally. I mean, in the end, I managed to get half of it back but they had the other half, which they never returned to me. Now, within the financial institutions of the banks, what is to say that this um, will not happen? You know, they've got control of your account. They've got control of everything. They've got control of all the transactions you do, even if it's penny pinching. I mean, I, I hear people complain, say, about um, eBay and PayPal, you know, that... Um, uh, they can hold over transactions. If someone lodges um, or asks a question now, say on eBay, um, it actually opens a dispute. That means eBay will not send you on your money. They've held it over. But it's to their advantage. Because if there is any interest to be made, when they've got hundreds of thousands of disputes happening, worldwide on eBay, where they're holding over money, who's benefiting from it? It's obviously uh, eBay and it, PayPal. It happened to me. I saw the phone yeah. on PayPal, and my daughter said, Mom, it's easy. Just sell your phone on PayPal, and you know you can get the money. And I sold it for $100, and they stopped the transaction because the person said the phone wouldn't work. And I'm like, the phone works. There's nothing wrong with the phone. And PayPal's like, well, we got to take their word for it that it doesn't work, and yeah, they're going the to return the phone. Right. 
Yeah, and when they returned the phone, the charger was missing. It wasn't in the same box. And so, of course, I had to dispute that because I didn't get everything back I sent. So, you know, it was. It was tied up quite a long time. And I saw something in the mail the other day. They were They're going to have some kind of settlement for anybody who had that process happen. But it also brought me to an uh, thought that, you were talking about the penny pension that they're doing over here. I don't know if they do it there, but when my baby girl had her first job about eight years ago at a little Burger King, they gave her a little debit card and they paid her on the debit card. And many of these businesses now, instead of giving them a handwritten check to take to a bank or, you know, a drafted check so they can go to a bank and open a bank account and, you know, have their check go into the bank. If they do not have a routing number, when they get hired, they're automatically given that little debit card and their checks will go onto the debit card. Now the debit card again has the fees that they take out of it. And I was thinking one day about the people that leave a dollar on there, or maybe they leave 35 cents that they don't spend. Or maybe they forget a whole paycheck for a day or two that goes on to that card because they're busy and they're they're working two and three little part-time crappy ass jobs. There is no telling at the angle that these uh, financiers have gotten a glimpse of uh, seeing everybody on a card. Because if they could see everybody on a card, the 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 pennies that they make are millions that they can confiscate back because. The card itself will belong to Cracker Barrel. It belongs to Dairy Queen. It belongs to McDonald's. It belongs to, so it's not actually their card. It is in their name, but the account is with them, even though it's their paycheck. So I think about that a lot because I think that's stealing. I think it's wage theft. I think that these children are not being taught how to build credit or how to open a bank account or balance a checkbook. Um, they, you know, they can't go online and check transactions. and Maybe they can. I don't know that they can. But I think it's just one more way of penny pension. The poorest of the poor for the few dollars that they do have. Uh, it eliminates their ability to, um, like uh, he was reading, you know, have a little jingle in your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's basically, um, it's, it's, just, it's just more control. More control. We all know that money doesn't really exist. Money is financial. It's got nothing to. It's like the financial system has nothing to do with the economy of the countries anymore. It used to be tied in an old way that you know whatever the economy exported, um, you know, was its wealth or, or with world trade and that. But that that's all gone now because finance has nothing to do with whatsoever with the economy. It's a separate thing altogether. It's not tied to the economy. I mean, we don't have an economy in the UK, Gina. We have nothing. We sell nothing to nobody. The only thing that keeps this country going on pure finance, nothing to do with economy, is one mile square mile in the middle of London called the City of London Corporation, where the banks and, of course, where these um, psychopaths are. You mean that foreign country? In yeah, my own little principality, that's right. So, um, and you know, uh, it's all about control and it's complete and utter um, feudal system on steroids that, that William the Conqueror brought here in 1056 over a thousand years ago. I did do a little thing with, um, with how the commercial trade started in England and actually William the Conqueror brought it over. He didn't bring it over, he brought over um, the Jewish people in 1066, which then used this commercial um, document called a Shita. If you go, uh, I think it's probably three or four episodes ago, I've done a, a little bit about it. And basically, that's how, you know, things were, were tied on not only immovable uh, goods, but immovable, i.e. land. So that's, um, I mean, 200 years later, Edward the first Longshank liked it so much, he got rid of the Jewish people and um, banned them and, and um, told them to go on the beach and at low tide and swim for it. And he liked it so much, he put it into a, a statute called the Statute of Merchants. So um, 
of course, the Silver Spoon Brigade got on that with the banks and whatever, and that's the rest of our history from a thousand years on, basically. But again, it's not money is it, it's a, it's a means of exchange, as they say, but it's we make the money, we sign the check, we make the agreement, we sign the check, we generate the money, but oh no. They don't want to take 10% and say, thank you very much, there's your money, now go and spend it. You know, uh, they want to make you pay back the whole amount plus interest that you've made for them. It's madness. It's absolute madness. And that's the monetary system. That's how it is. Um, I think we need to get back. I think if people, whatever you do, go self-employed, okay? And they can chase you for the tax. Now you you then have uh, all the higher ground, you know, instead of uh, paye. And ask for cash only. You only get paid in cash, and you only pay your bills in cash. Because if the cash goes, the two percent or three percent here or twenty percent in in the states where Gina is, if it goes, it is game over. It is total control in all ways and shapes. And forms and people will be um, slaved. In, in, we are slaves now, but even more heavily enslaved if it's possible than what we are now. So I'd say to people, get out there, do your thing, get paid in cash only. If nobody doesn't want to pay you or they can't, pay, go and find something else. Don't, don't, don't say, oh, I can't get a job. Well, I don't, don't have a job. A J-O-B means you have a, a corporate master, as Gina says, or a slave master. So be your own boss, be your own man, be your own woman. Uh, only accept cash as payment and pay your dues if you want to pay them. The tax man can argue, offer you and get it off of you, you know. He, you have it and uh, that's the way it used to be when I was a kid. My father was self-employed most of his life and that's how he played the game. But he always done everything with a proper, lawful, written contract. And nothing else. That was two signatures and a witness. Anything he done in And that's how he brought me up. So um, I'm an old boy now. <laughs> but uh, uh, those, those models will, will go, go to the grave with me. And um, I, I think that's how we need to get back. And, uh, a lot of people say, oh, you old boys going back this and that sort of thing. Well, there's no going back, no going forward, is there? Um, so uh, what is time? We could go into that. But I think that's what we need to do. I think that's a check and balance on the system. Even though it's only 2 or 3%, um, it's still 2 or 3%. And if they get it all and we have a cashless digital credit bit system, whatever you want to call it, Rob, then it is game over, I'm afraid. That is the big the big the big one, I think. Even more than a than a war. That's even more dangerous than a war. I mean wars are bad enough. So there we have it. So um, yeah. Stick with the cash. Don't accept anything else. And don't pay. If they don't take cash, take pay. Not my problem. There's the cash. I'll pay you. If you don't want to take it it's your problem, and then let's let's do that. I say, keep the cash. <laughs> yes, and barter or recycle. Yeah. Oh, and remember, intrinsic value means more. It means value than nothing at all. It's got to be something that's and precious metals has always been there since well since we traded precious metals in the UK, Celtic days, Celtic coinage, two, three, about three, three thousand, three thousand years ago. So it's always been there, it always will be there. Um, and it's our check. It's the people's currency, the people's money. Precious metals has always been the people's money. Even from the early English Saxon penny, which was silver. So there we go. You're muted up, Rob. No, you're not. No, you're not. 
I was just going to thank you for asking me on the show today. It's been a interesting uh, topic, and I learned quite a quite a bit about some uh, more recent news on that, and I appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome, Gina. Anytime. It's really nice to see you, and um, and nice to talk to you. And you, it's always good to hear what you've got to say on the other side of the, the pond, as we say. And uh, keep us informed about what's going on. I mean. There's so yep. much going on all over the United yeah. States. Um, well, if yeah. you go down, we all go down. So keep up the good work. With us, so. I like to keep my feet on the ground. I like to say I rattle the bushes and, and make noise. But, you know, with my ear to the ground, I know what's going on for the common people. And that's who I really speak for over here in a grassroots way. That's um, why my group is called Team Rural. Uh, we're on Facebook. If you'd like to like the page or go to teamrural.com, I'm going to be redoing the website. But, um, you know, I have to admit the Peasants' Revolt and the Red Dagger uh, by Babylon Royal on YouTube did inspire me quite a bit and I thought well no wonder they don't want to organize rural. I've been around since 2009 and have had a great success organizing a very poor people in rural areas um, but they are the ones that are you know uh, most uh, taken advantage of and so they don't know their own power um, and I don't really have a podium to speak from uh, much over here. So it's, you know, always good to get insight from what's happening around the world. I think that's why I wanted to know if they were buying gold. And it was surprising because, you know, just over here, the elderly get a, a envelope in the mail. Put your gold in the envelope. We promise we're going to weigh it and we're going to mail you a check back. And someone said, should I do that? I said, hell no, don't do that. Don't, don't put your gold in a thing. But it's secure and it's insured. No, no don't do that. But see, these are the common employees that they're using everywhere on poor people. And so it just lets you know it's a small world after all. And they have not um, changed their uh, tricks, you know. Yeah. No, that's right. And, and we mentioned about um, merchants is the odd word for um, <laughs> is uh, I'd actually speak with my brother the, the other month, and he's had several people come back knocking their doors, knocking their doors. Have you got any jewelry, any gold and silver jewelry? Not, 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 um, not Romanese or Travers or, or, or whatever you want to call them. Actual guys um, that are going around and putting flyers in, collecting, collecting people's gold for, for next to nothing really, because the prices. Uh, compared to what it was um, after 2008, it, 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 you know they, they've artificially um, played the price down with the paper. The paper um, uh, J.P. Morgan has suppressed the silver price because they have silver certificates on the market. They, they, you, what's the point of buying silver certificates if they're made of paper? It doesn't make any sense to me. No, no sense whatsoever. If you ain't got it in your pocket, you ain't got it at all, and that, that's it. And if it ain't intrinsic, it's it's a handful of nothing. Exactly, because there is no known empire in history whose paper fiat currency outlasted the empire. It never happens. It's always gold or silver that lasts. Yes, absolutely, and, and that's. That. That has happened many, many times. If, if people want to Google it, the history of fiat currency, even the Chinese failed with it thousands of years ago. There you go. So it's nothing new. It's an old trick. It's always, uh, it always ends in failure every time. This is long overdue, and it's not going to change. Um, it will end, and. The danger is to slip over onto the digital currency, but even that is not going to happen easily, peacefully, and without a hell of a, a lot of disruption and a lot of suffering. So if you're not prepared, um, you've only got yourself to blame, really, um, because there's been plenty of warnings, and hopefully, if you're uh, listening to this tonight, just do your own stuff, Google it, get some intrinsic, put it by, but don't put it in a, if you're going to put it in a bank, put it in an earth bank, you know? 
a bank made of earth, far more safer. And actually, it's much more intrinsic as well. <laughs> okay, Gina, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'll just put it over before um, before we close the show to Ron. Anything final you want to make any comments on, um, Ron? Uh, yeah, you talking about, um, you know, going back many years ago and such like, you know. Uh, but one of the things that you, you didn't touch on, or I'll bring it up now, is weights and measures. Oh, yeah. Because I, d I don't know exactly when during the medieval period this was brought in, but I mean, like, um, you know, like, um, obviously coinage as well, um, you know, uh, could be measured by its... Um, you know, uh, you know what it was made from. You know, uh, whether it was silver, it had to be a certain weight. That's right. Or, or a measure. Yes, right. And um, you know, uh, what used to happen, as you know, was these coins uh, would end up being clipped. Yeah. You know, bits taken off them. But then uh, also, um, you know, we had the weights and measure system put in that you know a loaf of bread would weigh when baked two pounds you know and uh, other you know foodstuffs corn you know um and such like in fact uh, um what, what weren't some of the um the, the weights and measures classed after the names of coinage anyway i can't i can't recall but you know we, we have a system in place where you fairly got a fair measure for what you paid for it but I've been noticing more and more as the years have gone by, um, you know, maybe it's just my imagination, but the thing's getting smaller, you know, like a Mars bar. They're smaller. They're smaller. You know, and do you remember wagon wheels? Somebody said wagon wheels have got smaller. And someone said, oh, no, they haven't. They're exactly the same size as what they were back in the 60s. Then some guy said, it just so happens I've got a wagon wheel from the 60s. Oh, I think, I think, years. I think if I remember up, right, it dubbed, was much bigger. Yeah, they dubbed that shrinkflation, Ron. Yeah, yeah, you know, like everything is getting smaller, packets of biscuits and that, you know, I mean, like, um, so how, are you actually now being robbed, you know, are, are you, you know, in another way, uh, you know, is your money being taken away from you and you're now getting less? Well, yeah, they are. Well, I mean, one one particular thing that it's, it's not so much e even selling you something under false pretenses, which is not what the item is stated, like beef, for instance. Remember the yeah. meat scandal? There's a great example. You know, they were selling horse meat. There's nothing wrong with horse meat, if you like that sort of thing, but you're not going to pay prime beef prices for it. No. And that's well, after that scare, for some unknown reason, I, I, I just loved eating hay. I, you know, I, I don't know why, but it just, this is why it got me. I knew something was wrong. No, no I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly, touching on the coin weights, yes. I actually got a couple of uh, medieval coin weights I, I collect. I used to collect coinage years ago when I was younger, um, all different... Um, Throughout, even back to Celtic coinage, and uh, they used to in the medieval days. That's quite right. They they had a, a coin weight for each coinage, from the penny to the um, um, to the penny to the half penny to the half groat to the groat to the shilling uh, to the angel the half angel, and each one had a coin weight that measured it exactly. Because like you say, especially on the silver coinage of the hammered the hammered silver coinage of the medieval days. That's right, they used to clip the coins, clip the bits of silver up, and then they'd make another coin and mount it down, all the bits and pieces. Of course, if you were caught doing that, it was an instant death penalty. You, um, you didn't get um, let off lightly for that. But, um, yeah, you're quite right. I actually got a couple of coin weights um, uh, in my little collection, what I've got left of it now. Um, for that period and the, and the coins and every coin should have an appropriate weight for them like the weights and measures. So, I think this happened with American coinage as well because um, you know you, you've got like uh, what is it the silver dollar but um, the uh, over the years I think because people might have clipped 
even the silver dollars, uh, they started um, reducing the silver content in them and added more nickel, uh, but still called them a silver dollar. Um, well, of course, you know, yeah, they, that's another way they used to devalue in the old days. Like, um, if, you, if you were a collector of Henry the Hague's coins, his coins were had a nickname called Copper Nose. What yeah. happened? Is the silver content was so debased they had put a lot of copper in it. On his portrait, his nose always used to get rub off and it used to show the, the copper because there was very little silver. Same as the Roman Empire, they debased all their silver denaries to the point where, you know, there was hardly really silver in it. So they actually devalued their currency by putting less of the precious metal in the coinage and done it that way. Coin clipping was a was a, mm. another way of doing it where the where the rogues. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they I think they discovered all the lead mines over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so yeah, absolutely. But um, there we go. Well, interesting chat, people. Thanks for coming on. Um, it's it's something that has got to be watched because I think with everything that's going on, and there's tons of it. Um, you know, this this one's going to sneak by if we're not careful. Um, I, I, I think, you know, basically it's still going to happen uh, and it's going to be a lot of um, disruption. And um, But you never know with these sneakies. You know, people are so apathetic now that they're just like, to say, oh, yeah, yeah it's, um, of course, after Monday we've all got to pay with these credits. Oh, well, hey, hum, I've got to go to work and yeah, let's get on with it, bend over more. No. So that could happen, but I, th I think it's still going to be quite disruptive. But anyway, at least we at least we know what to do about it. So thanks for coming in. I uh, enjoyed it immensely, and we'll do it again. Uh, I thought I was going to be on my own tonight, so I'm really pleased with that. So thanks very much. Um, we'll catch you again, Jim. Right. Good evening. Good night, Nan. Good night, Gina. Good night, Ron. Thanks for coming in. Catch you later. In yeah, a few yeah. minutes, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Yeah, bye.